Okay, happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, it had to happen, my sister's coming to visit me. So, uh, she has a long request of dishes I have to make. And just like the Havelinas returning to Dimmick County to eat their prickly pear cactus, I am gonna, I'm gonna prepare something for her. We'll see. Anyway, lots of stuff going on in the world. WHO uh, has got a new dashboard out. We now think that there are 580 million cumulative cases of the 7.8 billion people on Earth. But if you assume that's about probably a huge underestimate, maybe four times more than, you know, about the world's population, about one third of the world's population has been infected uh, by COVID, myself included. Uh, which is about the same number, actually, as the 1918 flu pandemic. The difference is the number of deaths. So we have recorded about 6 million deaths. We all think it's probably more like 20 or 25 million deaths due to COVID. But if you go back to the Spanish flu pandemic, it was actually 50 million, so 50 to 70 million. So, you know, that, that pandemic was <laughs> as bad as this one is. That one was even worse. Uh, the good news is uh, worldwide, the number of cases is actually finally beginning to go down. It dropped by about 9% last year, I mean, last week. If you look at where the hot spots are in the regions, the, you can see Europe was really the big place that, uh, for the last spike. This was the big Omicron spike in January, and then this is what's been going on in the summer. Most of the cases are in Europe, with, some in, with the second most being in the Americas, particularly the United States. And finally, the cases are beginning to fall in the U.S. Uh, we're still at around 100,000, but it's trickling down. Uh, there's been a drop over the last week. And the other good news is hospitalizations are finally beginning to fall. Deaths are a lagging indicator. Remember, people who are dying have been sick for many weeks. And so uh, those aren't falling yet, but hospitalizations are. Uh, BA4 and 5, actually BA5 is the dominant uh, variant. If you look at four and five together, they account for 94% of all the variants. So pretty much BA5 just outcompeted all the other variants. But the good news is there hasn't been a new one yet. I say yet because you never know. And you know, there's still a lot of places that are the virus is replicating. The daily trends is from the CDC. You can see case numbers are actually flat, but we think everybody knows this is a vast underestimation. But hospitalizations are a pretty good uh, indicator, and you can see hospitalizations have finally plateaued and dropped last week by 4%. And as I mentioned before, mortality is really not dropping. It's just sort of trickling along, and it's a lot lagging indicator anyway. So our friends at Dimmick County, we love them. They're actually in good shape. They have 168 cases down from 175, 100,000 and less than 10 admissions per 100,000. So by the CDC uh, reckoning, that's low risk. Harris County remains high risk, but it's coming down. So we, we're down uh, from 278 cases the week before to 234 cases per 100,000, and we're at about 18 admissions per 100,000. Remember, the CDC, in order to be low, has to be under 10 hospitalizations per 100,000. You know, we're back to collecting data in the Texas Medical Center, and the good news is hospitalizations have peaked and are now beginning to uh, fall. And probably the best indicator of all is the wastewater data, and the wastewater data has peaked and is now coming down. So remember, the wastewater anticipates by about two weeks the total amount of the case number. So we will begin to see a decline in case number in our community, and hopefully by the start of, start of school, We'll have, we'll be low, and then everyone can relax until the next variant. Anyway, uh, so, you know, we talked a lot about, uh, a lot about vaccine mandates and whether they were useful or not, uh, but there was a real interesting paper in the National Bureau of Economic Research. Remember in 2020, early on, I had, I had posited that the college kids going to school was like a great opportunity to spread virus throughout the country. Uh, and there was a lot of data to support that, that where you saw, especially the big state schools, when they came to, to class and came to, on campus, the community numbers went very high. So this was a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research to look at whether or not va vaccine mandates helped. And so they looked at the 13 weeks in the fall semester of 2021 where there were vaccine mandates and looked in those counties what was the impact on the community. And what they found was that 
it reduced the number of cases by, uh, by 339, 340 cases per 100,000, and the number of deaths by 5.4 per 100,000 residents. So if you had a vaccine mandate at a college, you actually lowered the number of cases in the community and mortality, and they estimated that uh, mandates in, in uh, college campuses probably accounted for a 5% reduction in mortality. So whether you like mandates or not, it certainly worked to mandate the kids in college be vaccinated because it has a huge impact on the community. Obviously, you're attracting people from all over the region to come there, and they're, you know, if you can have them uh, vaccinated, it made a difference. I've got a lot of questions about the fourth dose. Should I get the fourth dose? Should I wait? So there was an interesting study in JAMA that came out this past week on uh, healthcare workers in Israel. And what they basically found was that if you had a fourth dose, you had a significant uh, protection. Four, you had a reduction uh, in reinfection, 6.9% uh, in those that got four doses versus 20% that got three doses. So here's the, the graph. You can see a pretty, pretty good separation, four versus three doses. So the point is that second booster really does make a difference. And this was in a group of healthcare workers, so more likely to be exposed. So I would recommend, as I have been, get your fourth dose, and we'll see if there's an advance in, in uh, vaccines uh, later in the fall. There's also an interesting paper in Science that looked at uh, mRNA vaccines in mice versus uh, nasal application. And basically, uh, what they showed is what we've been talking about, that you know, the, the problem has been the mRNA vaccines were very effective initially but they are very good at stimulating the uh, IgG, which is in plasma, but not very good at stimulating IgA, which is mucosal, which is why people continue to get infections, but not necessarily serious disease. And so Eric Topol and uh, Dr. Uh, Akiko Iwasaka, uh, Iwasaki had uh, a commentary on the paper, and the, the point was that they are also saying, look, we need, we need better mucosal immunity to stop not only just infection, but transmission. Uh, and so, you know, there are now 12 nasal vaccines that are in clinical development. Four have reached phase three, which is good. Codagenics, uh, which is the farthest along, has announced, uh, we haven't seen the data, but has announced positive results in a press release showing strong uh, cellular immunity as well as IgA response to BA2. So this is, a, this is great. You know, hopefully, we'll have a second generation of uh, vaccines coming out soon that will provide better protection, particularly giving you IgA response. Okay, a little bit on, on monkeypox. First of all, I want to uh, point out that um, last week I, I made a slight mistake. Uh, I was talking about smallpox being uh, er eradicated in, in 1980, which is true, 1981-82 was declared, the WHO declared um, that the smallpox had been eradicated, but uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics stopped recommending vaccinations uh, in 1972. And so I'd mentioned if you're over the age of 40, you, you know, you likely have been vaccinated, but it actually is the age of 50, because in 1972, and thank you, Dr. Decker, on our faculty for pointing that out to me. Uh, so again, it, it, it makes a difference for, you know, if you're over the age of 50, you've probably been vaccinated. If you're under the age of 50 and in a risk factor, in a risk group, uh, for monkeypox, then you probably should be vaccinated. So last week, Biden officials declared monkeypox uh, a public health emergency. You know, why do you do that? So the, the, if you designate something as a public health emergency, it mobilizes resources, it speeds distribution of vaccines, and treatments expands the ability to do uh, multiple testing. So, you know, it's not, it's not like tear your hair out scary. It's just they're trying to increase the, mo uh, the number of resources that go to supporting monkeypox. So we're up to almost 9,500 cases, if you look at it. Uh, this is the map with, you know, mostly California, New York, Texas, and Illinois being the hot spots. Here in the state of Texas, uh, the Dallas, Dallas County declared monkeypox outbreak a health emergency because they have the largest number of cases. Uh, you can see almost 345 uh, cases. Houston second with about 259 cases. And if you follow the number of cases in Harris County, you can see it's beginning, it looks to me like it's beginning to decline. The dark line is a cumulative number of cases, and these are, uh, the bars are uh, number of cases uh, per week or per day, and you can see it's beginning to drop. But, you know, again, uh, you know, 
we've talked about vaccines and all the controversy over vaccination. People are doing some crazy things. So if people are not getting vaccinated against measles, there's measles outbreaks. There's now uh, polio has uh, shown it's shown up in the wastewater of New York. There are now actually uh, seven different wastewater samples in adjacent uh, counties in North New York City uh, that are positive for polio. And there's one case a person tested positive positive for polio who's unvaccinated in adults in Rockland County and suffered paralysis. So, you know, this is a broader issue. This concern about vaccination is is like making <laughs> we're walking backwards from all the advances we made since like 1920. So this is really going to be a big issue to make sure that people believe in vaccinations, that they're useful uh, and continue to uh, get vaccinated. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Decker, uh, who's on the Department of uh, Pathology and Immunology, who let me know of my error. Thank you. Uh, I have 2,500 fact checkers on the faculty. <laughs> it's amazing. I don't make more mistakes. Uh, I also want to uh, give a shout out to the wellness program. We were notified that Baylor is ranked second in Texas in the 2022 Healthiest Employers of Texas program of large employer group. Uh, we are very proud of our wellness program and we've always been in the top nationally and in the state. So a big shout out to our wellness team. And finally, you know, school is coming back soon. Uh, and I want to do a big shout out to Nancy Marino and the Center for Educational Outreach. Uh, they were named a recipient of the Insight into Diversity Magazine's 2022 Inspiring Programs in STEM Education. So uh, this looks at all the STEM schools. We, as you know, we have this whole program with the Bakey High and Ryan and Russ Middle Schools, as well as many different schools throughout the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, uh, we had the teachers and faculty in from Ryan and Russ uh, just the other day, and it was great to see them. They're all excited about the school year. And we were really excited about the STEM uh, plus medical health education that we provide for middle school and high school kids. So anyway, I'm going to be seeing my sister. I'll give her a big shout out to all of you. And I hope you have a great weekend. I'm going to have a stressful week. I'm going to have a whole family stressful weekend. Anyway, look forward to seeing you next week.